sing to him, sing praises to him, speak of all his wonders, glory in his holy name. Let the heart of those who seek the Lord be glad. Let us sing together our opening hymn, hymn number 173, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. have in Jesus. That looks like a sober man. I think I'll hire him to cut wood for me. There was That was said of a man on the streets of Lake Rice, Canada as he walked along carrying a wood saw and a sawhorse. The response from a man nearby was, that's Joseph Scriven. He wouldn't cut wood for you because you can afford to hire him. He only cuts wood for those who don't have money enough to pay. That seemed to be the philosophy and attitude of Scriven, a devoted member of the Plymouth Brethren Church. He had a sincere desire to help those who were truly destitute. Joseph was born on September 10, 1819 in Ireland. His parents had financial means enough to afford a wonderful education opportunity for their son. He was enrolled in Trinity College in Dublin where he graduated with a bachelor's degree. In this young man, Ireland had the prospect of a great citizen with high ideals and notable aspirations. He fell in love with a young lady who was eager to spend her life with him. However, on the day before their wedding, she fell from her horse while crossing a bridge across the river ban and was drowned in the water below. Joseph stood helplessly watching from the other side. In an effort to overcome his sorrow, he began to wander. <clears throat> By age 25, his travels had taken him to an area near Port Hope, Canada. He became highly regarded by the people of that area. He tutored some of the local children in their schoolwork. It was there he met a wonderful young woman, Eliza Roche, and again fell in love. They had exciting plans to be married. However, tragedy reared his ugly head again and she died of pneumonia before they could wed. As indicated earlier in this story, he labored in Port Hope among the impoverished widows and sick people. He often served for no wages and even shared his love, his clothes with those less fortunate than him. On an occasion when Joseph became ill, a friend who was visiting with him discovered a poem near his bed and asked who had written it. Scriven said, the Lord and I did it between us. He thought the poem would perhaps bring some spiritual comfort to his mom who still lived in Ireland. Scriven had not intended that anyone else should see it. On August 10, Scriven's body was pulled from a body of water near Boodley, Ontario. Two monuments have been erected in his honor. Each has the first stanza of his song engraved on it. Charles Converse, an attorney and composer, wrote the musical setting used today.
this morning. I want to go over a few items uh, on Tuesday, uh, this upcoming Tuesday. Don't forget if you are a leader, deacon, deaconesses, we meet at 7 p.m. Uh, the trustees, you also will be meeting at 7 p.m. followed by the full council that will be meeting at 8.15. On Thursday, Circle 1, you'll be meeting at 9.30 a.m. at church. Uh, and Mary Davidson is the hostess. Circle number 2 will also be meeting at the church at 2 p.m. And circle number three will meet. will be meeting at the church at 7 p.m. And then on next Sunday, if you come to church here, you'll probably be by yourself outside because we won't be having a church here. Uh, but the Farm <coughs> Festival, will have our community service there. Pastor Darren will be giving the message, and that will be at 10 a.m. Um, and as always, we have the, the fellowship meal. Uh, we'd ask that you would bring a side to share. Uh, and uh, it's a really good time, if you haven't been to it before, to get together with uh, fellow Christians in the community and take part in that community service. Um, also, on September 16th, uh, for youth, we're having a uh, Youth for Christ Amazing Race kickoff. So we're kind of starting into the new year. Uh, they're having a special event, kind of like an Amazing Race <laughs> deal. Uh, so if you are in grades 7 through 12, you are invited to come to the community center and that starts at 7 o'clock. Um, also, if you have been struggling with grief, there's been a lot of, um, a lot of people that have been struggling through a, a lot of loss as of late. Uh, there is a grief support group, uh, and uh, from what I understand, it's a, it's a really good group, and that's taking place in, uh, at the church in Stanley, the AFLC church, and that starts September 12th, and it goes all the way through December 5th. You don't have to go... Uh, each Saturday if you don't want, but every Saturday from 10 till noon at the AFLC Church in Stanley, they're having the Grief Share Support Group. So I want to encourage you uh, to attend that if, um, if that's something that you think would benefit you. Also, uh, we have a very exciting thing coming up that Kareen Coffin's going to share about right now. Come on up, Kareen. Um, and it's for a fundraising banquet that is going to benefit uh, the Dakota Hope Clinic. And I'm going to have her share more about that now. Good morning. So every Wednesday at the uh, Women's Health Clinic in Fargo, North Dakota, 21 abortions are performed every week. It is an essential service. It never stopped through the coronavirus. So there are dotted throughout this state uh, faith-based pro-life clinics 
that offer counseling and alternatives to abortion. And uh, they are a very loving and compassionate service, but of course, they can't do it uh, without the help of donations. So there are two major fundraisers each year. One is the banquets in September. The other is the Festival of Trees in November. So this month, on the 21st and 22nd of September, there will be two banquets, one in Stanley and one in Minot, and that insert is in your bulletin. Um, how it works is that you go to the banquet, you register with me or online or by telephone, and you go to the banquet, and your meal is provided free. Someone has already donated the money for your meal. And then you get to listen to a dynamic speaker, someone who may have had an abortion, someone who had a like experience. Then at the end, they request donations. And you give what your heart, what is put on your heart to give. So I encourage you to consider attending a, one of these banquets. And if you can't go, and there are reasons why people can't go, um, consider sending a check with me so that this service can continue and babies can be saved. Thank you. All right, thank you, Crane. And uh, we're going to call our president of our congregation, uh, Lee Olson, to come up. And uh, we, we're kind of in an interesting situation right now because we're kind of just about ready to move into the new building. And he's going to share about what that's going to look like. Good morning. Um, I don't know if you realize it or not, before when we talked about moving into the new church building, that it was uh, in two weeks. So really, this could be our last service at Zion today. Uh, we're, we're trying to work through some things, but uh, I think next or in two weeks, we'll meet up at the new church for uh, our first service. Things might not go the way we really want them to go, but uh, I think we have to make the move. We've been putting it off and putting it off. I think it's time to do it. I think it's time to make the move. So we're, we're thinking we'd like to have something for a closing of this facility that we've enjoyed for uh, all of my life. Uh, I know a lot of the other people have been here a lot longer than I have, but uh, it's been a been a big part of our lives. Um, so we're we're working on that. We're thinking maybe the Saturday before uh, we would have something here in the evening, but we'll let people know about that. We're gonna have some pretty good discussion, I think, at our meeting on Tuesday night. So just kind of wanted to plant that seed in your in your head that. Uh, this is this is reality. The building is so close up there. We've got a lot of little things to do. We'll probably be asking for some volunteers to help move some pianos and things like that. But uh, that'll be coming here in the next week, week and a half. So, thank you. Uh, remember us in your prayers, please. All right. So to reiterate, this is our last normal service here on Sunday. We're going to shoot to have a, uh, a kind of a going away service on a Saturday, uh, but in two weeks, our service will be up at the new building. Um, also, uh, we're still looking for someone to help clean the new building. Uh, Yvonne has been uh, a great worker here and, and helping to keep this building clean, but she has shared that she won't be doing that at the new building. So if you're looking to, uh, to get some, some hours for part-time work, uh, you can talk to Lee about that also. Uh, we're always in need of help with the sound booth and the sound ministry. There's a lot of things that go on with that. Also the live streaming. Uh, so if you're interested in helping with the live streaming, working the sound booth, uh, and even beyond just Sundays, just putting things into the, uh, into the computer so we can have them on the screen, we need help with that as well. So we're very thankful for Brenda who has uh, volunteered for I think over two years and then uh, she was paid towards the end of, the end of uh, her time. But we're very thankful for the work that she's put in. But we need other people to step up to fill that gap. 
So I believe that's all of our announcements. And now we're gonna have the, have oh, we have one more announcement, yes. So Awana Clubs will be starting on the 23rd. Uh, an ice cream truck for registration on the 23rd in the West Pavilion of the park. So we're excited about that. Not a picnic this year, but the ice tr cream truck from Williston will be there. So all the kids can come out and sign up on the 23rd in the park. Awesome, thank you. And now we're gonna continue uh, to worship with the Women's Quartet. Congregation, please rise for our scripture lessons. Our Old Testament lesson this morning is found in Psalm chapter 27. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked advance against me to devour me, it is my enemies and my foes who will stumble and fall. Though an army besiege me, my heart will not fear. Though war break out against me, even then I will be confident. One thing I ask from the Lord, this only do I seek, that I may dwell in a house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. For in the day of trouble he will keep me safe in his dwelling. He will hide me in a shelter of his sacred tent and set me high upon a rock, 
Then my head will be exalted above the enemies who surround me. At his sacred tent, I will sacrifice with shouts of joy. I will sing and make music to the Lord. Hear my voice when I call, Lord. Be merciful to me and answer me. My heart says of you, seek his face. Your face, Lord, I will seek. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You have been my helper. Do not reject me or forsake me, God my Savior. Though my father and mother forsake me, the Lord will receive me. Teach me your way, Lord. Lead me in a straight path because of my oppressors. Do not turn me over to the desire of my foes. For false witnesses rise up against me, spouting malicious accusations. I remain confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. Our epistle lesson this morning is the basis for this morning's message. It's Romans chapter 8, verses 26 through 30. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called. And those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. And our gospel lesson this morning is found in the book of Mark, chapter 9, verses 14 through 29. When they came to the other disciples, they saw a large crowd around them and the teachers of the law arguing with them. As soon as all the people saw Jesus, they were overwhelmed with wonder and ran to greet him. What are you arguing with them about, he asked. A man in the crowd answered, Teacher, I brought you my son who is possessed by a spirit that has robbed him of his speech. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him to the ground. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth and becomes rigid. I asked your disciples to drive out the Spirit, but they could not. You unbelieving generation, Jesus replied. How long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. So they brought him. When the Spirit saw Jesus, it immediately threw the boy into a convulsion. He fell to the ground and rolled around, foaming at the mouth. Jesus asked the boy's father, How long has he been like this? From childhood, he answered. It has often thrown him into the fire or water to kill him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. If you can, said Jesus, everything is possible for one who believes. Immediately, the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. When Jesus saw that a crowd was running to the scene, he rebuked the impure spirit. You deaf and mute spirit, he said, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. The spirit shrieked, convulsed him violently, and came out. The boy looked so much like a corpse that many said he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him to his feet, and he stood up. After Jesus had gone indoors, his disciples asked him privately, Why couldn't we drive it out? He replied, This kind can come out only by prayer. Here ends our scripture lessons. For our confession this morning, we'll be using a confession of sin, uh, and sometimes we use confessions that are printed in the book or on the screen, uh, but it's also good, I think, to spend some time to, to, to spend uh, confessing your sins privately to the Lord. Um, we're going to prepare ourselves for communion, for communion today, and the Bible says that we should examine our heart. Uh, by doing that, we need to ask ourselves two questions. The first is this, am I a baptized believer sorry for my sins. And if you are a baptized believer and you're sorry for your sins, that answers the first question. The second question is, am I living in sin? Is there something that I am holding on to? Perhaps it's unforgiveness. Perhaps it's anger towards someone. Perhaps it's something else that you're holding on to that you've not let go. If that's the case, the Bible is very clear that you should not take communion until that sin is dealt with. So we're going to spend some time silently confessing to the Lord And then I will close us in prayer. Let us confess our sins to the Lord now.
Heavenly Father, we thank you for loving us, for washing us of our sins, Father. Lord, we all stand before you guilty and deserving of punishment. But your word tells us that when we confess our sins to you, that you are faithful and just, and that you will forgive us our sins. So, Father, we thank you that we as a congregation, though, though that we are sinful, we can come together as sinners, confess our sins to you, and know that our sins are forgiven. Lord, and a little bit later as we practice the Lord's Supper, and, and we take your body and blood, Jesus Christ, we, we take it for the forgiveness of our sins. Lord, even though we recognize that we are sinful, we recognize that you completely and fully wash us and cleanse us and make us perfect in your sight. We thank you for this, Lord. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. The congregation may be seated. Again, as a reminder for the offering, uh, we won't be passing the offering plates to try to limit exposure to one another, but if you have an offering, you like to place it in the plates, uh, that is in the back. We now like to ask all the children to come forward for our children's sermon. of you guys like to read books? Does anyone like to read books? What's your favorite book that you've liked to read? Oh, I love series. Series are really good. So it's Charlie Bowen. All right. Does anyone else have any special books or series of books that they like to read? What, what do you like to read? You had your hand up too. Do you have... Captain Underpants, wow, that sounds like a great book. Well, I, I love to read books too, and I'm rereading a series that I've read in the past at least a couple times, and it's about a, a captain of a ship, and his name is Horatio Hornblower, right? Another series of books that I've read a couple times is The Chronicles of Narnia. Look at this big book, and this is just one book and a series. Have any of you read The Chronicles of Narnia? This one's The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Have any of you ever read this book? You are missing out. This is a killer good book, right? And the best part about this book is it's not just one, but there's a bunch of books, you know? And there's a book that actually comes before this, and there's a few books that come after this. But, you know, sometimes books are a little bit like our lives, you know? Like even this church, right? When this church was founded... It was founded way back in the beginning of the 1900s, like 1903 or so, right? That's a long time ago. So that would be like way in the very beginning. And we, as a church, are kind of like in this book, and we are like right at the very, very end of this book right now. So as a church, we're kind of in the back of this book right here. What's going to come after this? Well, in a, in a series of Chronicles of Narnia, it's the horse and his boy. And in a couple weeks, we as a church are going to be moving, and we're going to go all the way up on the top of that hill and have a brand new building. And it's sort of like starting over again with a new book and a series. Now, if you look out there, do you see any old faces? You don't have to say who they are, but do you see any old faces out there? You see a few of them, right? No, you don't see any old faces. Well, I see some old faces, right? And some of those people have been around here a long time, right? But guess what? You guys are getting older and bigger and stronger and wiser. And before you realize it, you guys are going to be older. And perhaps some of you might even have children of your own. And hopefully, you'll be sitting in a church. It'll just be up, up on top of the hill. And you'll be part of another book in the series of our life at Zion Free Lutheran Church. Now, what's important is not the building here. What's important is not the building up on the church or up on the hill. 
what's the most important thing about the church is you guys, is all those people out there. Because what makes a church a church is not the building, it's not cool looking candles, it's not the pulpit or any of that other stuff. It's not even about the pastor. What makes the church the church are the people that come to the church, that we worship together, and that we're worshiping God because God is worthy of that. So, as we go up to that new church, I want you guys to think about, someday you might be a little bit older, someday you might even get married, and someday you might even have children of your own, and they'll be like you guys sitting at children's church. All right? Well, thanks a lot, guys. You can have a seat. Yeah, sure. There you go. You can remain in your seats. We'll continue to worship as we sing together hymn number 457, Pass Me Not, O Gentle Savior. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved.
Heavenly Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of every present heart be acceptable to you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. When I was a young man, only a few years out of high school, right after my military service, I, I worked at Sears uh, as I was going through college. And while I worked at Sears, I learned the value of getting and having good tools. I came to understand that if you had the right tools for the job, you could save a lot of money fixing things yourself. But I also came to quickly understand that, that just having the right tools <laughs> doesn't make you a carpenter a plumber, or a mechanic, right? I mean, there, there's some skills that you need to have to come alongside of those tools. I may have had some of the tools that I needed, but I definitely lacked a lot of the, the knowledge and even the wisdom to use those tools. Fortunately, God gave me a, a man in my life named Ken Bailey. Ken was a Christian man that, even though he had some very different views on some, some different doctrines, he and I became pretty close friends. And even though he never had the, the shiniest or, or the newest or the best tools, the tools that Ken had, he knew how to use. And there were a few different times where I found myself over my head with something and usually had to do with my car. And, and I could give Ken a call and he'd say, Rich, just, just bring it over and, and we'll work on it together. And, and he would help me. You know, while I haven't seen Ken for years, I can still consider him a, a good friend of mine and, and know that if I'm ever back in the Pittsburgh area and, and perhaps I needed a hand changing my brakes or doing something else on the car, I could probably knock at his door and he'd probably still be there and I'd say, hey, Ken, can you help me fix something? And he'd say, sure, Rich, let's do that. People like Ken stand out to me because of their willingness to help me in my time of need. Perhaps there are people that come to mind in your mind that, that have been there when you really had a time of need, you know, when you were really down and out or you were over your head with a problem. They were there to help you. It's one thing to say a person is your friend, but it's completely different when that friend demonstrates their love and their care by being with you in your time of need. You know, when the chips are down, and you have nothing to offer, and someone stands by you in your crisis, in your time of need, that is a true friend. Today, as I preach through Romans chapter 8, verses 26 through 30, I'm going to be focusing on the fact that God is a really good friend for us, that wants to stand in the gap for us at our time of need. When we have nothing good to offer God of ourselves, God is still there helping us, holding us up, developing us to be those perfect people that we were always meant to be. While the original recipients of this letter were the believers in the church of Rome, I believe today we can read these words and be equally blessed by applying them to ourselves. So if you have your Bibles and I'd encourage you to open them up, we're going to be going through Romans chapter 8. I'll be beginning with verses 26 and 27. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. You know, the first way that we see God helping us from this text is that God in the person of the Holy Spirit is literally praying for us. The Bible says that the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. Man, I, I love that. that. That God who dwells in, in, in the lives of in the heart of every believer, that God himself and a person of the Holy Spirit is praying for us. And we don't hear it audibly, but they're through wordless groans. Why would God do that? Why would God pray for us and in us? Why wouldn't God just do what he wants to do? After all, he's God. He doesn't need to pray to himself. Why take the extra step of praying? Well, I believe it's because God is deeply and intimately connected to us. 
When we become Christians, the Bible says that we very literally become the temple of God, that God dwells in us, just as the Israelites had the, the tabernacle, and it was, it was a temporary tent dwelling place that was set up where they could worship God, and God indwelled literally in those tents. And then later on, God had the, the Israelites create the temple, and Solomon built this beautiful temple, and then God's very presence rested in the Holy of Holies. But something unique changed at the cross of Christ. You see, when Jesus died on the cross, there was this really thick curtain that separated the Holy of Holies where God dwelled in the rest of the temple. And that very, very thick curtain tore in two. And it was symbolic of a very real event that was happening, that the presence of God was leaving that temple and now was dwelling within the hearts of every believer. Wow. How does it make you feel to know that God is in you and that you are his temple and that he's praying inside of you? Have you ever been in a position in your life where you were so crushed that you weren't sure how you could even go on living? Perhaps you've been, been struggling with depression and it's been deep and you don't feel like there's ever an end to it. Perhaps maybe you've been there where that, that time where you just didn't feel like you could go on and function any longer. When those times happen in your life, we can take very real truth from this scripture and realize that you aren't alone that God is with you, that you are not without help. God, in a very real and powerful manner, is working inside of you, praying in you to accomplish his will. Now, God, in his omniscience, knows how hot to turn up the furnace of our lives. You see, a goldsmith will put gold into, a, into like a container or a vessel, and, and he'll superheat that container until it gets so hot that all the impurities float up. It's called dross. And they skim those impurities off so that what is left is pure and refined gold. But for that goldsmith to be able to do that, you have to have a really hot furnace. You know, that's what happens to us as well. Especially in the Old Testament, there's a lot of scriptural understanding that, that, that God, in a very real sense, allows us to be refined through the fires of our lives so that the crud gets burned off. Sometimes God allows you to go through very deep and dark and difficult times in your life so that all of the stuff that you're clinging to that is worthless is burned up. And those things that you've clung to that you thought are going to hold you up and, and they're gone and you're looking around saying, God, I don't know what to do. And God says, I do. Trust in me. I'll get you through this. And God knows just how hot to make that furnace. See, God's desire is never to destroy us. God doesn't want to crush us down with, 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 with putting his thumb on us and putting his screws on us. God doesn't delight in that. But what God does delight in is very gently and very carefully turning up the furnace of the trials in our lives so that when everything else melts away, all that we're left with is God. There might be a very literal sickness in your life that you're afflicted with. Perhaps there'll be conflict or strife within your own family. Who knows what those, the, those furnaces are going to be like, but know this, they are coming if they haven't already happened to you. The crucible of refinement will never be easy, nor will it be painless. But know this, God is with you through this. He will not only be by your side, but he will be praying with you and for you and in you. You might be saying, well, pastor, I don't want that. If God's all powerful, and he is, then why can't God just change me and make it as painless as possible? That's what I want. I want painless. Well, here's the sad truth. The minute that our ancestors 
disobeyed God in the Garden of Eden, at that moment, God said, you've chosen the hard way, and this is not what I wanted. But now, this is what's going to happen. Sure, God can teach us lessons about life and himself and good times, but God doesn't just limit our training to when the times are good. This next verse reminds us that because God's unlimited power, he will use the good and the bad and everything in between to craft us into the people that God wants us to be. Verse 28, if you have your Bibles open, the Bible says this, and we know that in all things, boy, I wish he didn't say that, but we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Who is doing the work here? Is it us? When, when, when bad stuff is happening, do we have to try to figure out, oh God, I don't really know how this is supposed to work. God, what am I supposed to do? You've, you've got a plan for this. What's, we don't have to do that. Why? Because if we look here at the Bible, who is the one that's doing the work? It's God. And we know that in all things, God works for the good. When you're in that crucible of refinement, God is doing the work in us. It doesn't feel good most of the time, but he's the one doing the work. When I was told that my car needed about $700 worth of brake repairs, I still remember it vividly. I went to Moreau Brake and Muffler Place, and they put my car up on a jack in Bethel Park, Pennsylvania. And they said, oh, Mr. Carr, I'm sorry to tell you this, but your, your calipers are all shot, and there was brake fluid that was dripping from them. And they said, yep, you've got to replace all of this, and it's going to be at least $700 worth of work. And I said, put the tires on. I'm driving it out of here. And some of you are probably saying, oh, I can't believe you said that, right? I drove it down to my buddy, Ken. I said, Ken, I don't have $700 for, for all this brake stuff they, they say that I need. What do we need to do? So let's put it up on a jack. We put it up we, when he's looking. He's like, what did you say was happening? Oh, there's fluid dripping all over it. He said, there's no fluid dripping here. They just must have splashed some brake fluid and said that you needed to have all this work done. All you need to do is spend about 50 bucks and replace the pads and the shoes and you'll be good to go. Wow. It was good to have someone there on my side that knew what they were talking about, that was willing to come alongside of me in my time of need and help me. Doesn't God do that for us? You know, there's, there's a saying that when life gives you lemons, you make what? Lemonade. Oh, man. I think we've probably all been there before, right? That means when bad stuff happens, allow that bad stuff to be used to make something positive. The reality is that this doesn't really even apply to us. When bad stuff happens to us, or even when good stuff happens to us, it's God who's doing the work. It's God who's transforming us to become the person he wants us to be. We don't have to make the lemonade because God is saying, I'll make the lemonade. Just hold on through this time. Trust in me. Cling to me. And I will get you through it. It takes the pressure off of us, doesn't it? If we can rightly understand, and I believe according to what the scripture says, because again, it's God who's doing the work, not us. That when that crucible of refinement happens, God is the one that's doing the work in us. It's like working on a project with the master. <laughs> you know, my brother was, was in, a, in the carpenter's union for a while, and, and uh, he's working at the VA hospital, and man, he can do woodworking like no one's business. One of the times when I was back, he showed me some of the projects he was working on, and he's got these hand tools. I mean, it, it's amazing the kind of stuff that he can do. And then for me, trying to build just like a box, oh, forget it. You know, it looks like a kid from third grade just didn't know what they were doing. Because if I'm going to do something, I've got to have someone like my brother. I've got to have someone who is a master at their job to come alongside of me to help me to understand it. 
you know, and the unions are pretty good at understanding this as well. That's why they, they oftentimes will pair a master with an apprentice, whether it's a carpenter or an electrician or a plumber or something else. They'll, they'll take someone that really knows their job, that really knows what it is to do it well with someone that doesn't really know much at all, and they'll say, watch how I do it. Then over time, as the apprentice grows, the, the master gives them a little bit more responsibilities, and, and they start to become more proficient to the point where the master kind of backs away completely. And then the apprentice himself has become a master. But here's the cool thing about us. God is our master. He's always there with us. He never leaves us or forsakes us. And unlike in a carpenter's union or some other union where eventually that master pulls away completely and says, now you do it on your own, God won't ever do that for us. He may give us a lot more control of what's going on around us, but he never leaves us. He's always there. When we're in our darkest trials, when we're in our highest highs, God is right there with us. And not just as a master who looks down on his, on his apprentice and says, what a goofball you are when you mess up. But he looks at us as his child who loves us and adores us and helps us. He will always be there. He will always be with us. And if you think it couldn't get better, it does. Look back at your Bibles in verse 29. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. Now some people read this and they get so worked up. Ah, oh, predestination, oh, I don't understand this. And then it's like they turn their mind off and they say, I just don't get it, I give up. Some good-meaning Christians will even tell me, Pastor, I don't believe in predestination. I say, well, that's fine, the Bible says it. And you can disagree with what the Bible says. It doesn't make it any less true. Predestination is a real thing. It's like saying, I don't believe in gravity. It doesn't make gravity not exist. Verse 29 says, For those God foreknew, he also predestined. Now, predestination is a deep and difficult concept I won't disagree with. But there are some basic things about predestination that we can all understand and agree with that can help us. The point of predestination is simply this. God chose you to become a Christian. That means, again, that who's doing the work? God. It takes the pressure off of us. God's the one choosing us, doing all of the work. Only this time, God's the one doing the work of what is necessary to save us from our sins. Now, if you struggle with understanding predestination, I want to encourage you to simply accept the fact that God has chosen you to be saved and that this choosing has nothing to do with you. It has everything to do with God. And you say, so what? You know, the minute that we start to put God's choosing us on something that we do, we got to ask the question, have we done it enough? Have we continued to do it enough? Do we do enough to maintain our salvation? God, have I done enough so that I'm worthy to have been chosen by you? We don't have to ask any of those questions because God does it. And God doesn't do it because of what we do. God does it simply because of his choice. And verse 30 of our sermon text lays out there's this, this natural progression of work that God does in us. Not only is God doing the work in, in each of these stages listed in our faith journey, but God is also helping us along the way. Verse 30 says this, And those he predestined, he also called. And those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. What does it mean to be predestined? It means that God has chosen you before the foundations of the world were ever created so that you would be saved from your sins. And for those of you that have Jesus as your Lord, you are chosen by God. When I was a young kid, we'd line up to play kickball or football or something else. I was scrawny. I wasn't real athletic. 
And if I ever got chosen, it was usually, oh, oh, Rich has left. I guess you get him. <laughs> I wasn't ever even really chosen. I was like the default. You know, the best way I think that we can understand God's choosing us is, is a very North Dakota way. <laughs> it's picking June berries. You know, you know what I'm talking about, Tim. If you want to pick June berries, you don't have Tim pick them because he's like me and he's just going to pick them all and put them in that bucket. And Crean's shaking her head. Yep. Because when you pick June berries, you got to pick them when they're just ripe, not when they're overripe and starting to rot and not when they're underripe. You got to be really choosy and pick the right ones, the perfect ones. <laughs> and that's what God does with us. We're like June berries. And it's not because of what we do like June berries where they get sweet and succulent and, and they're just right. God picks us when we're nasty and, and all dried out and nothing to offer. And God says, I'm picking you anyways because I'm going to change your heart and I'm going to create in you a new life and I'm going to make you my child. That's a good way for us to understand predestination, that God is picking us very carefully, like he picks June berries. And we can never forget what makes us acceptable to God is Jesus. We all have a bill to settle with God at our death. And God is going to extract a very heavy price on all of humanity. If you haven't settled that bill with God, you will be sentenced to eternal separation from God in a very real and literal place called hell. And you will pay for that bill for the rest of eternity. But for those who have surrendered their lives to Jesus, that means that you are justified of your sins. That means that Jesus has paid the price in full for your sins. So now in being, instead of being separated from God in hell, you can spend an eternity with God in heaven. Not because of our works, not because of anything else, but the good works of Jesus Christ that he freely gave to us to pay that price. And finally, brothers and sisters, we have this process in, in verse 30. At the end of our lives, as, we, as we've gone through this, this process of being predestined, and we've been justified, we end up with being glorified. What does that mean to be glorified? Have you ever looked at an acorn? I mean, my brother and I would pick up the acorns by the buckets and we'd hurl them at each other and we'd have those metal uh, trash can lids as shields and they would ping off of them and, and sometimes you'd get welts on your bodies where, where you didn't block the, the acorn. But there, there's not much to an acorn. It's just a, like a little nut and you can't really eat it. What do you do with it? <laughs> you throw them at your brother. <laughs> But if you take an acorn and you plant it in the ground and it dies, it grows up into a little sapling. Eh, it's not a big deal. And then that little sapling grows up into a little tree. It's a little neater. And then over 100 or 200 years they go by, there's this mighty oak tree from this tiny little acorn. I think that's a really good picture of what it is for us to be glorified. Right now, on this earth, we're like a little acorn. Good for not much else than to throw it against your brother, right? But over time, when we become glorified, and God gives us our new bodies in heaven, <laughs> boy, it's going to be great. It's going to be a transformation that's beyond when an acorn becomes a giant oak tree. That's what we have to look forward to when we are glorified. And the best part of all of this, the best part of all this process that we go through is that God is our master. God is the one doing the work. God is the one who is right alongside of us, helping us throughout our lives so that when life gets you down and you wonder about how you're going to make it through that next day, you don't need to worry. God's already in the future. Nothing's going to surprise him. God has all the power necessary to use all of the things that happen to you in your life, the good, the bad, and everywhere in between, 
to refine you, to make you into the man or the woman or the boy or the girl that, that God has destined you to be. God has a purpose to make you into a holy and perfect saint, a child of his. And through Jesus Christ as your Lord, that is what it will be. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word that you've given us. Lord, I thank you that as we look in, in Romans, we see so much deep theology, and, and, and sometimes it can be confusing. But Lord, you simply tell us that you are the one that does the work. You are the one that helps us. You are the one who is the master that we can look to, that we can cling to in our time of need and know that you are in control and that you are helping us. Lord, if we're going through a crucible right now of refinement, Lord, help us to let go of the things that we think are so necessary and trust in you. And Lord, as we let go of the unnecessary things in our lives, Lord, replace them with what is necessary with faith and trust in you. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. So the congregation would take out their packets from communion. The night in which Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it and he gave it to his disciples and he said, take and eat. This is my body which is broken for you. In a similar manner, after supper, he took the cup and he blessed it and he said, this is my blood which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink in remembrance of me. We've already confessed our sins to the Lord. We've already examined ourselves. So let us take off the top of our containers and take the body of Christ. This is Christ's body broken for you. Take and eat. As we peel off the top, we are about to partake in what is simply at first grape juice. But because it's coupled with God's word, we know that it's much more than that. That this is Christ's blood. And as we take this, let us also remember and know that we take this for the forgiveness of our sins. Take and drink. Though your sins were as scarlet, they are now white as snow. Washed in the blood of the Lord. Amen. Let us pray together our Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and a power, and a glory, forever and ever. Amen. Will the congregation please rise as we sing together our closing hymn, hymn number 425, Whiter Than Snow. This was written September or February 14, 2010, by Barry Ga Kaufman, a blogger. With the historic weather we are having in Lancaster County, almost everyone is talking about snow. Most are tired of shoveling and being snowed in. We shudder when we hear the predictions of even more snow. But we also have to admit that it is beautiful, especially when it is pure white, newly fallen, and undisturbed by humans. I've often wondered if King David ever actually saw snow, but after he had committed adultery, he prays for forgiveness and cleansing. And in verse seven of Psalm 51, he said, he says, cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. He knew that the only the Lord could cleanse his sin and make him pure whiter than snow. Numerous hymn writers have picked up on this theme. One of those was James L. Nicholson, a native of Ireland. He came to America around the age of 25 
and lived in Philadelphia for almost two decades. Around 1871, he moved to Washington, D.C. and worked there as a clerk in the post office department. We really don't know much more about him, but in 1872, he penned the words to this next hymn. We can only assume that Nicholson, like David and countless others, recognized the need to seek the Lord for forgiveness and cleansing, to be made whiter than snow. And he also knew that when one seeks this cleansing, the Lord will never say no. Maybe this old hymn shares a need that we all have. Meditate on these words. And the words on the very bottom, if you'll sing along with us this time, please. Through faith. 
receive now the benediction. And after you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself perfect, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be dominion forever and ever. Amen. Oh.